Uh, thank you very much for, for joining us today, no matter uh, when or how you're tuning in. I'm Dr. John Iskander. It's my pleasure to welcome you to CDC Public Health Grand Rounds for April 2017 on the National Amyotrophic Lateral Sclerosis, or ALS, registry. A reminder that Public Health Grand Rounds has continuing education credits available for physicians, nurses, pharmacists, veterinarians, health educators, and others. Please see the Public Health Grand Rounds website for more details. Um, our required disclosure for this session is noted on this slide. This month, Public Health Grand Rounds is streaming on Facebook Live, uh, and it's also uh, available on uh, uh, webcast live on our website. Uh, please send comments or questions to uh, grandrounds at cdc.gov. Uh, along with today's presentation, we provide uh, interview segments posted on YouTube and our website uh, called Beyond the Data. Uh, this month, uh, I interviewed both Dr. Paul Meda and Ms. Uh, Becky Kidd, a person uh, living with ALS. Please, uh, please uh, watch those online. They're, they're quite memorable. Um, we've also partnered with CDC Public Health Library to highlight scientific articles about ALS, um, and we periodically publish follow-up articles from past sessions in uh, CDC's uh, Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. Uh, here's a preview of upcoming Grand Round sessions. Please join us live or on the web at your convenience. Um, in addition to our outstanding um, speakers, I'd also like to acknowledge the important contributions of the individuals listed here. Thank you. Uh, and now, uh, to open our session, uh, we will have remarks from uh, CDC's Acting Director, Rear Admiral Ann Shuckett. Well, thanks so much, and, and welcome people here in the room and those on uh, watching from our other campuses and watching through the live stream as well. Um, I personally found the materials put together for today's Public Health Grand Rounds extremely compelling, and I hope that you will too. They brought to mind memories from my first few months of internship, which is, of course, a critical period for every young doctor in training. During that period, I cared for a patient with ALS who was in our hospital's intensive care unit for several weeks. I was struck at the time with his calm and dignity as he coped with a body that was no longer cooperating with him, and as he tried to help his family adjust to what he knew to be the inevitable next phases of his deteriorating condition. In 2008, Congressional legislation led ATSDR to establish a registry to count and at the same time connect people with ALS with researchers and partners. Now, as you will hear, we have numbers for people affected, but we have so much more. The innovative strategies that the ALS registry adopted are applicable to other conditions, and through the work of this registry and many partners, you can see the beginning of hope for people with ALS and their families emerge. So please enjoy today's session. Our first speaker is Dr. Kevin Horton. So good afternoon. Um, thank you all for coming today. Um, I'd like to extend a, a, a big welcome to our pals or our patients with ALS who made the uh, journey here. We know it's not easy for you to get here, but we really uh, appreciate everything that you're doing and especially supporting the, uh, the registry. So um, today I'm going to be talking about ALS or, or Lou Gehrig's disease. And um, ALS is a rapidly progressive fatal neurological disease caused by the degeneration of motor neurons. Um, Unfortunately, ALS has a very high case fatality rate, as approximately 80% of cases die within two to five years. Um, we do know a little bit about um, the epidemiology of ALS in that an estimated 10% of the cases are familial or um, genetic, and the remaining 90% are considered sporadic cases. 
And of these sporadic cases, the etiology is largely unknown. And unfortunately, there's been no definitive cause to date um, that has pinpointed what, what's behind ALS. Now, there have been a number of hypotheses that have been uh, looked at, um, and these include things such as uh, chemical exposures, uh, things such as heavy metals, uh, volatile organic compounds, pesticides. Um, other things that have been looked at include infectious agents, uh, nutritional intake, um, physical activity, and then probably one of the ones you've been hearing in the news lately is uh, head trauma. Unfortunately, ALS does not have a cure. So cur currently there's only one FDA-approved drug for ALS, and this is called Rilutec, um, but this drug only prolongs life by about two to three months on average. So um, ALS, like many non-communicable diseases, um, is not a notifiable disease in the U.S. And this is, um, this is an important thing to note. This means that doctors and healthcare facilities are not required to report newly diagnosed cases to, health, to state health department, uh, which in turn notifies CDC. And without these case counts, um, there's really a lack of reliable incidence and prevalence estimates for, uh, for the U.S. So um, in October 2008, as was mentioned, Congress passed and President Bush signed the ALS Registry Act. And I just want to say that this act was largely uh, passed because of the grassroot, grassroots efforts of patients, um, caregivers, um, various ALS organizations around the country. And while the act did not make ALS a notifiable disease, it did give us footing here at CDCATSDR to create a population-based ALS registry for the U.S. And so if you look at the objectives that Congress uh, laid out before us, these are, these are the, the main ones here. Um, really, to describe the incidence and prevalence of ALS, so in other words, how common is this disease? Um, also to look at the demographics of those living with the disease. So who gets the disease? How does it affect Caucasians versus African Americans and so forth? And then I guess perhaps the biggest in my book is what are the risk factors for uh, the disease? So given that um, ALS is a non-notifiable disease, ATSDR uh, had to develop novel case-finding methods to identify and track ALS cases. And this was particularly challenging given that, given that ALS is considered uh, a rare disease and the U.S. has over 300 million people. So the proverbial needle in the haystack saying is, is certainly appropriate to uh, ALS. And so after several years of pilot testing uh, various case finding methodologies, ATSDR launched the National ALS Registry in October of 2010. And so through our pilot efforts, we identified two primary ways for capturing um, ALS cases. Um, the first approach on the left-hand side um, applies a pilot-tested algorithm to large national databases to identify cases of ALS. And these databases include um, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, a couple of databases from, um, from the VA. And some of the uh, variables that go into the algorithm include the diagnostic or billing code for ALS used by physicians um, and providers, and this is also known as the, the ICD code. Um, we also look at frequency of visits uh, to neurologists, and then we look at prescription drug usage. So is a person on Rilutec? Um, the algorithm helps classify individuals as cases or non-cases, and so those who, go, those who are identified as cases go directly into the registry, while those non-cases obviously don't go into the registry. And those, if you see here, the potential ALS patients, um, those, that just means we don't have enough uh, information to make a decision one way or the other. Are they a case or are they not a case? And then on the right-hand side, this is probably where most people um, know us from. Um, this is a secure web portal that allows people with ALS to self-identify. 
And patients with ALS answer a series of online validation questions, and these are things such as, has a doctor ever uh, diagnosed you with ALS? And depending upon how they answer, they're either considered a case or not. And those who are cases will um, be electronically consented, and they will set up an online account so that CDC can capture relevant demographic data. Uh, another important thing about the, the web-based approach is that it allows ALS enrollees to take brief online risk factor surveys um, that help CDC learn more about the possible causes of ALS. And again, we look at things such as uh, occupational history, uh, residential history, history of head trauma, um, and Paul's going to be talking more about uh, uh, these risk factors. So cases then from both approaches are, are merged, deduplicated, and this is to ensure that we're only counting a case uh, one time. So ATSDR, we publish annual reports of our findings in CDC's morbidity and mortality report. And our first two uh, published reports covered calendar years 2011 through 2013. Um, our third report for calendar year 2014 is ante anticipated to be published in late summer of this year or possibly early fall. And you're going to hear more about previous findings shortly from, from Dr. Maida. So uh, one of the things that I think is important to, to emphasize here is while you know, determining epidemiology of ALS is one of the main objectives of the registry. Um, the registry also conducts other important activities to help both patients and researchers learn more about uh, the disease. So, for example, uh, the newly integrated um, National ALS Biorepository that we just launched um, in January, we collect pre- and post-mortem biospecimens and these are th things such as hair, nail, nails, blood, tissue, um, from registry enrollees um, to help researchers better understand the genetics of ALS. And this is really the only biorepository of its kind that pairs detailed uh, epidemiological data with high-quality biospecimens. And to date, thousands of biospecimens have been uh, collected from patients around the country and they are currently being used by uh, researchers um, around the country as well. Um, the registry also funds external research to help the ALS community learn more about the etiology and risk factors. Um, and so to date, we've funded uh, 13 research projects, and these include things such as large-scale genome-wide association studies, or GWAS studies, um, gene environment interaction studies, and studies um, involving uh, biomarkers and risk factors of, of ALS. Um, another important activity is using the registry to recruit um, patients into clinical trials and epidemiologic studies. As you can imagine, clinical trials are very important for um, patients not only to learn more about the disease, but to potentially get um, some therapy that may be able to treat um, the disease. And so clinical trial enrollment in general is, is pretty difficult and it's costly. Um, the registry actually speeds up recruitment time. It increases study sample size. It helps achieve racial and ethnic and geographic diversity. And best of all, it's a free service to uh, researchers. And so to date, the registry has helped scientists in the public and private sectors to recruit hundreds of patients uh, into um, 26 research studies at the moment. And I just want to say a little bit about how we promote the registry. Um, you know, if you build a system, um, you have to make sure that people understand that the system exists and, it, and that it's there. And so we work with a number of partner groups around the country to, to promote the registry. Obviously, patients um, are our target population, and we engage directly with them um, through patient forums, advocacy meetings, ALS walks, uh, social media, and so forth. Um, we also work with large national um, ALS patient organizations to promote the registry. And these organizations represent a majority of ALS patients throughout the U.S., and they help us promote the registry through their multidisciplinary clinics, 
through their chapters and offices, which covers most of the U.S. Um, another important partner are healthcare providers, such as neurologists. And these folks are critical because they see patients on a daily basis, and they can really serve as a mouthpiece for, um, for the National ALS Registry. And we interact with many of these um, clinicians at uh, national meetings and conferences. Um, ATSDR, we also work with other federal agencies. This includes agencies such as the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs, and we work with these groups to secure administrative data. Um, and we also work with NIH, and they've been helping us genotype our, our biospecimens. And then we also partner with research institutions uh, by providing uh, epidemiologic data and biospecimens to help support their research projects. And so just in conclusion for my slide, this is the first and only population-based ALS registry for the U.S. that's quantifying the epidemiology of the disease. Um, as I mentioned, it's being used as a recruitment tool for research, specifically for clinical trials. Um, we're awarding funds for external research to look at risk factors and etiology. And we're also providing epi and biospecimen data to scientists conducting research. And really, at the end of the day, we're trying to build the evidence to better describe the ALS uh, experience in the U.S. And so now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Dr. Mehta, who will be discussing um, in more detail the, the ALS epidemiology. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Um, good afternoon. My name is Paul Maida, and I'll be talking about the known and unknowns of ALS. Lou Gehrig was diagnosed with ALS in 1939. Over 75 years have, have gone by, and ALS continues to frustrate researchers and patients with the lack of information about etiology as well as viable treatments. Currently, there are more unknowns than knowns about ALS. No one knows what causes ALS, but progress is being made. The latest prevalence estimates of ALS for 2013 show almost 16,000 cases in the U.S., or a prevalence rate of five cases per 100,000. As with any surveillance system, it is impossible to capture all the cases of ALS. We know there are missing cases. For example, those patients who get their care from private insurance rather than Medicare, Medicaid, or the Veterans Administration. ALS continues to disproportionately affect whites, males, and those between the ages of 60 and 69. We are not sure why ALS affects whites, and especially males, more so than any other group. This continues to be a vexing issue for researchers. There is another group that impacts ALS at a higher rate. It is our military veterans, specifically men. Those who have served are at greater risk of ALS than those who have not served. For example, Vets who have served in the first Gulf War were twice as likely to develop ALS as those not deployed to the Gulf. We are not sure why veterans are at risk, but it may be environmentally linked. More research is needed to investigate etiology. Sports and ALS have also been in the news recently, specifically football. It is unknown why football players are at a greater risk of ALS than, than the uh, general population, but it is believed it may be due to repeated con concussions. More research is necessary to fully understand the pathophysiology of ALS, especially among football players. Nationally, the incidence of ALS does not appear to be rising. Prevalence continues to inch upward for several proposed reasons. First, patients are living longer with comprehensive care from their multidisciplinary centers, where they get their care at one location. These large ALS clinics provide patients with their neurological, nursing, dietary, physical therapy at one center. However, not all patients get their care this way, and those living in rural areas see their local primary care physician or neurologist. In addition, the register continues to mature and does a comprehensive job capturing more cases, that is, better case ascertainment. ALS etiology is elusive, but we know there are two types of ALS, sporadic or familial. Sporadic ALS accounts for the majority of cases, approximately 90%. Familial ALS is the rest at 10%. Familial can be linked to certain genes shown above. There are currently around 20 genes for ALS and more continue to be identified. 
C9, North 72, and SOD1 are the most commonly identified in patients. Familial ALS is most often autosomal dominant. Parents with this mutation have a 50% chance of passing it on to their children. Not all who inherit the gene will get ALS, mind you. Patients who are diagnosed with familial ALS typically show symptomology earlier. Counseling is available to these patients as well. One way the registry is helping explore ALS etiology is through the completion of our risk factor surveys. Currently, patients who have enrolled in the online portal can have completed over 60,000 surveys. These surveys will help researchers further explore ALS causes and risk factors. Currently, the registry has 17 risk factor surveys, which are taken by patients who enroll via the online portal. The purpose of these surveys is to shed light on ALS etiology and whether certain factors can either be protective or contributory to disease insult or progression. The surveys are diverse, ranging from demographics, smoking, alcohol consumption, uh, disease progression, as well as environmental exposures, such as the pesticides use. There is also a survey that allows patients to tell us what they feel may have caused their ALS. Findings on the first six surveys have already been published, and the registry scientists are currently examining additional survey findings. In addition, these survey data are also available for external researchers for analysis. In order to further promote ALS research, the registry has added the National ALS Biorepository. The Biorepository is part of the registry, and patients must enroll in the registry in order to participate. The registry conducted a multi-year pilot study to determine the feasibility of the Biorepository. A group of external subject matter experts provided direction and deemed the biorepository to be feasible. It was launched this past January. The goal of the biorepository is to promote research in areas such as biomarkers, genetics, and environmental exposures, such as to heavy metals or organophosphates. The sample collection scheme is geographically representative. That is, not all samples will come from one part of the country, but will be distributed based on demographics, sex, age, and population density. There are two components of the biorepository, an in-home collection, as well as a post-mortem collection. The in-home collection will consist of blood, urine, and saliva, with an annual goal of 675 samples. The post-mortem target will be 10 collections a year. There are a number of unique aspects about the biorepository. First, the samples collected are pristine, that is, not previously used or left over from another study. Second, these samples will be matched with the registry survey data, as well as the Global Unique Identifier, or GUID, which will allow researchers to track the progress of patients in multiple studies anonymously and securely. When researchers re request samples, they will receive not only samples, but the actual epidemiological data as, as well, such as demographics, occupation, military history, and so forth. Lastly, we feel a national ALS biorepository will facilitate ALS research on etiologies and possible treat treatments in the future. Thank you. And it's my pleasure to, for Dr. Kasarsis to go ahead and present on the uh, uh, provider aspect of uh, ALS. Thanks very much. Uh, it's a privilege being here to address this group uh, on this topic of ALS. Um, I'm going to be talking about basically research drug development and patient care and how it impacts on case ascertainment. And I think part of my, my goal today is to put the considerable achievements that you've heard about the registry into some perspective for those who may not be directly familiar with ALS. So ALS share some clinical characteristics with other neurodegenerative diseases. So our big three are Alzheimer's, everyone's familiar with, causing cognitive and behavioral dysfunction. Parkinson's, very much more prevalent illness, causing slowed movements and tremor. And ALS, consisting of weakness of most voluntary skeletal muscles. So the question always comes up, does it affect the heart? The answer is no. Does it affect intestinal smooth muscle? The answer is no. And also pervading my comments today will be the, the concept that ALS is a clinical diagnosis. So for non-genetic cases, we really do not have a definitive imaging biomarker nor a definitive test in blood or cerebrospinal fluid. So it, it really results or rests on the interaction between patients 
and uh, physicians to come up with the correct diagnosis. So the clinical characteristics of ALS are, are pretty much listed here. So typically, weakness will begin in one bodily region, roughly 80% of the time in a limb. So it'll begin very insidiously, very subtly, with perhaps a foot drop or just a little bit of weakness with hand function. The remaining 20-25% of the individuals will have difficulty beginning in the so-called bulbar region, which means difficulty with articulation of speech or chewing or swallowing function. So the formation of concepts and language is preserved, but the pronunciation and articulation is, uh, is impaired. As clinicians, we look for many things that are preserved or normal or relatively normal. So sensation is normal. Unless, of course, you have another cause for numbness on your feet, like diabetes, as an example. But ALS by itself spares sensation as a general rule. Sphincter control, voluntary control of one's bladder and bowel function, is normal. Eye movements, uh, by and large, even though this is under our voluntary control, eye movements remain normal, which is a tremendous statement because it is daily used by ALS patients to communicate if one loses their voice. Um, and awareness and cognition and memory I've already spoken of are normal. So the clinical outcomes of ALS, you've heard this already from Dr. Horton and Dr. Maida. It's really uniformly fatal. And the way it is a disease that limits the length of lifespan is because of ventilatory or respiratory insufficiency. So even though we can stop our breathing or start breathing rapidly, so these are under our voluntary control, uh, these muscles are also affected. And so I'll have a slide illustrating the progression of weakness keyed off of respiratory function. Really, as was already mentioned, uh, as extending survival for a short period of time. And as you heard already, most ALS patients have no family history, no primary first-degree relative with ALS, so they're, they're listed as sporadic, and the 10% are extraordinarily informative for us because you can do genetic testing, map the gene, create it, and create experimental animals uh, in order to study ALS. Not shockingly, people with a family history with genetic-based ALS, familial ALS, usually have a younger onset of age and perhaps a more rapid progression depending on the genotype. Now, these are illustrations of what ALS looks like, and we have many uh, attendees to this conference that are not here physically uh, present, uh, and so this is going to give uh, uh, a snapshot of what w weakness means from the neurology standpoint. Unfortunately, that sort of lay term is thrown out kind of <laughs> trivially, you know, everybody's having a bad day so you feel weak. But this is what real weakness is. This is a patient I uh, a videoed of about three months prior to this man's death. And so he a, represents a very advanced individual. So in the lower right panel here, I'm asking this individual to simply raise his hand against gravity. And you can see that uh, he's unable to do this. So when we're talking about weakness, this is really weakness. In the lower left panel, we talk about clinical findings that we look for. We look for muscle atrophy. You can see the muscle atrophy on this gentleman. And we look for fasciculations or spontaneous uh, contractions of muscle. And this will be illustrated here in this, uh, in this uh, slide as well. So it, it comes as no surprise that this gentleman is extraordinarily weak. And these muscle fasciculations usually are not troubling to the patient, but they're present. Uh, you know, most of the time by themselves, they don't merit medical treatment, but that's one of the clinical findings we look at. Now, already mentioned about bulbar weakness, and this gentleman is going to be protruding his tongue. You could look at this and see also atrophy on his tongue. And you won't be able to see fasciculations on his tongue because I'm asking him to protrude his tongue. But this is all that he can do. So it's not a shock that he's not going to be pronouncing his words clearly. It's not a shock that he's going to have difficulties chewing and swallowing, swallowing even simple stuff like water or pills. And 
the, vi the video on the left um, is going to be him responding to a question. So you'll hear the dysarthric speech, meaning the difficulty with pronunciation, and this should come through pretty well. I could be myself when my left name and now uh, the first of the year. So without even really examining him, besides these video clips, you see the preserved features. You saw him move his eyes from one position to another, so his eye movements are preserved. He's very alert, very intelligent man, and he speaks complete and clear sentences, mispronounced but complete and clear, so he doesn't have an aphasia uh, or uh, some central processing with speech. This is a slide that illustrates the cause of death, and this came from a CNTF study that's been published. This is a, a representation of percent forced vital capacity, which is a test of uh, a, a muscular test of breathing. And, and this is used very commonly in clinical drug trials. And on the far right at zero is the, the, the cohort's death due to respiratory insufficiency. And these data are backed up uh, in reference to the time of death. And you can see at the time of uh, entry into this study, the, the group as a group by and large had a forced vital capacity of around 65% of normal, meaning already they've lost considerable breathing strength at the time they were uh, entered into this study. And you can see month by month by month by month, uh, the ventilatory power is de diminished. And within about three months of, of their ultimate demise, um, you know, the breathing capacity is only one, one third preserved. Uh, this is an old study. It's in a way a natural history study. Uh, currently we intervene actively when the force vital capacity gets to about 50%. So there are a lot of clinical triggers that encourage patients and clinicians to intervene with, for instance, non-invasive ventilation at night. But this illustrates the point of <coughs> why uh, ALS shortens one's lifespan. This slide illustrates uh, some of the topics that were talked about already in terms of a motor neuron disease. In, in Europe, this will be known as a motor neuron disease. Here in the United States, we say ALS. So on the left panel, uh, in red, this is not an Atlanta uh, expressway. The, the, these, are, these are axons or projections from motor neurons in the cortex that project all the way down to the spinal cord. So when you think about this, in order to do a willed motion, like me waving my hand, uh, the first motor neuron, the final common pathway out of the brain, is motor neurons in the cortex. And a single nerve cell will project physically and connect with a motor neuron in the spinal cord. So depending on how tall you are, it might be a meter in length. The second neuron in the spinal cord is illustrated on the right side. These are the spinal motor neurons. These also are very long neurons. They will project and connect with skeletal muscle. And so for me to wave my hand, nerve cell number one is in the brain, nerve cell number two is in the spinal cord, connecting to the muscle, allowing me to make that motion. These are the cells that are vulnerable to ALS-type degeneration. These are the cells that degenerate and eventually die. And needless to say, when the electrical message does not get through to the muscle, it does not work, and you get muscle atrophy and weakness, such as was illustrated. Now, even though these nerve cells are large, you cannot image these directly currently uh, with imaging techniques such as MRI or PET scan. Uh, I think that will change in the future, but currently that's the case. So the diagnostic procedure is a challenge. And it's a clinical diagnosis, and so we look for these clinical signs uh, that I illustrated in the, in the previous slides, and we verify many things being normal, but at the end of the day, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. So we exclude mimics that can cause progressive weakness. The list is quite long. Uh, some of the testing will involve MRI imaging of brain and spinal cord, because of course if you have a stroke or a tumor or something like that, that could cause weakness. Uh, EMG, a nerve conduction study, 
I don't have time to go into the details. Every patient in the room is cringing when they think about this. It's not exactly the most pleasant test, but this directly examines whether the problem is in the muscle causing weakness or backed up into the spinal cord. And we do lots and lots of different laboratory studies to exclude other Ill illnesses that conceivably might cause progressive weakness. I put down here at the end, all patients must have a second opinion from another neurologist. I think this is a dogmatic statement, but when you're dealing with an illness with consequences, as I've described, this is uh, important in my judgment. So at the end of the day, how good are neurologists? <laughs> do we have any bragging rights? Well, actually, we, we do a fairly decent job. Uh, so the clinical diagnosis has about a 95% sensitivity compared to autopsy examination of brain and spinal cord. So if we have very, uh, you know, agreed upon diagnostic criteria. They go by the names of Escoriola with the Iwaji criteria, the early house. So we follow these criteria, and if we apply them and have two neurologists, basically we're doing a fairly reasonable job. A recent study coming out of Scotland illustrates this point. Uh, about 44 individuals in their registry came to autopsy, and the diagnosis was confirmed. So despite these challenges, uh, epidemiologic research, as you've heard, is possible. We have tools that quantitate, quantitate uh, muscle power, which are used for drug testing outcome measures. We have a self-rating scale, the ALS functional rating scale, uh, which is adapted to computer use over the phone, caregivers, and this will help map the progression of ALS. Illustrated here is a woman doing pulmonary function studies, such as you saw the FVC measured and survival, ventilatory, ventilation-free survival is another outcome measure. There are other measures of muscle strength and power and dexterity. Physical therapists, of course, do the timed up and go test. This is the Purdue pegboard. It looks like a cribbage board. These sorts of things are done as clinical outcome measures in, in various combinations and different drug studies. So by the time people become clinically impaired, Actually, the majority of vulnerable motor neurons, it is believed, have already degenerated and died. So clinical drug studies require a large number of patients, costly, and this is a major barrier to progress in terms of time and distance and out-of-pocket expenses. So with all of that, I'm standing here uh, with reasons for optimism. Um, I think the ALS research committee or community is expanding. Uh, it's extraordinarily passionate in what we do. I think the National Registry stands as a, a number one example of that. So my bold prediction, causes will be found, genetic, uh, non-genetic causes will be found, and further treatments will be developed. So I'm going to turn over to Ed Tesaro, who has fortunately joined us to talk about so, uh, patient life with ALS. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Ed. Hi, everybody. So, I'm Ed Cicero, and I was diagnosed at Emory Clinic in 2009 uh, with ALS. Um, I'll tell you today, in the few minutes we have briefly, about uh, my patient experience, the clinical trial participation, the wonderful times I've had with ALS families and persons with ALS, we call them PALS, and last, a little bit about purpose that I've come to understand. So to begin with, uh, I love my life. Um, I, I live it w with no regrets. Uh, I've never considered myself a victim of the disease because I believe in my heart that all of us have a wheelchair. Uh, in my case, it's quite literal, uh, 400 pounds of plastic uh, rubber and hydraulics, and I can kill people if I'm not careful with that thing. Uh, but with, with everything that goes on in, in my long life, uh, every, every family I know has had crisis, uh, whether it's caring for children or the dashed hopes of dreams and careers or family emergencies, life and death issues. Uh, we have to reckon with the human condition. And we can bend the curve a little bit, um, but we can't change it. We can be kinder to people. We can listen better. Uh, we can seek out those from whom we have much to learn. And uh, 
generally living our life that way is quite a salve, quite a bromide. Uh, the last one in, in my case is important, having to do with seeking out people who uh, have, that my wife and I have enjoyed so much. Uh, those families have changed our lives. I think there's 150 of them, uh, just to pick a round number. Uh, and uh, it's been a very big deal to us. Uh, it also means learning about activists and thought leaders in the national community of ALS. And you see a few, uh, six people in front of you there, uh, seeking out those individuals and their very private lives that they've decided to make public has been also very good for the science, for the fundraising. Uh, let's be clear about it. It's very important in this business. Uh, and um, we, would, we would all agree that um, ALS could be the most frightening disease in history. It's good. We, there's a good argument to be made. So the, the ongoing struggle to encourage newly diagnosed people to come in uh, and, uh, and talk about their condition uh, is a big deal. Um, and by the way, what I didn't mention is Ed Rapp on the left uh, will be here in October to uh, uh, honorary chair of our uh, annual MDA Night of Hope. So uh, another national leader who, who brings his story to Atlanta to help us do what we do. Uh, but um, there's an ongoing struggle to encourage do newly diagnosed patients to come forward. Um, uh, we've talked about the fact that it's, it's complicated, uh, but that people have this tendency to hide, to go inside, to uh, not want to have conversations with friends and family about the disease. And we just have to know that those first tendencies have to be dealt with. So uh, the cost of living with ALS, uh, we'd all agree, and, and the expenses listed there on the screen are pre-diagnosis, the medical, medical community expenses. But my point today is about the post-diagnosis personal cost that uh, those in my community have to go through. Um, first of all, the, every disease or injury is costly. Uh, but no injury or disease, I think, uh, requires as much personal expense as does ALS. The basic requirements to live with it involves, as many of you know, uh, home uh, renovation, vans with ramps, uh, expensive power chairs, lifts in your home, uh, every sort of ramp on the outside. It's in the 100 to 150,000 range before, just about when you get started. So the personal cost has to be understood because the fear of family financial ruin is a, is a very big deal. And the consequences of, the, of that fear uh, are more physical. So it's quite a vicious circle in, in that regard. So uh, there's, much to, there's much to understand about what, how we have to pay and how we need help and where do we go for resources that we'll talk a little bit about in a minute. So the next subject is uh, the openness of the medical community towards uh, researchers and, and investigators include toward new patients and their families. Uh, outside of major city centers like Atlanta, uh, patients are often in the lurch because as, uh, as my counterparts here have said, not everybody is schooled in an orphan disease or rare disease with 30,000 people. Even in Atlanta with my insurance plan, which I would say is very good, uh, I was misdiagnosed with spinal stenosis uh, eight years ago. I had a major back surgery, only to find that orthopedic people and neurological people don't use the same language uh, when they talk. So uh, if it can happen in Atlanta in the kind of, with the kind of care that I've had, uh, I know it, uh, it can get even worse. Why is that language not more common? Um, I, I'd say that's a great question to ask as we move forward. It should be. So next, uh, the patient process to uh, be uh, available to participate in a clinical trial. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty controversial subject. Uh, and to get information about those trials, why are only 10% of us 
in a clinical trial or a study in America. It's not like we have better options. You'd think the doors would be beaten down by people trying to get into this type of research, but there are obstacles and I don't, they won't be a surprise to anybody in the room. Um, delayed response to questions uh, on the trials we see listed on clinicaltrial.gov, which is a great site. Um, but it's not easy to get follow-up questions there. It's not easy to understand the status of those trials. Because if they go, go well, there are silos to be protected. If they go poorly, nobody really wants to talk about them. But patient issues um, are just difficult to get the answers you want. Uh, lack of awareness and uh, trial options, the burdens associated that Ed mentioned with uh, travel and cost are factors that also keep us outside of the research. Uh, common, doc uh, common doctor factors, uh, surprisingly, are the failure to personally advocate, to, even to their own ALS patients, um, uh, for involvement in a study or a trial. Um, in a study that I read, um, it's called uh, the absence of, of physician influence. That, you would think that would be the opposite. But um, again, it, it's a difficult road sometimes. So the next point um, is the counsel we need as newly diagnosed patients. Uh, to accept the, the reality of our disease and how to turn it into a life force. It sounds uh, kind of theoretical. But there's very little personal, personal counseling in the clinic playbook that exists today. It doesn't mean there aren't, there, there aren't people there to listen. Uh, there are, and the, the uh, ALSA and, and MDA clinics are outstanding. But there are more, there's more that the community needs. And I'll use an example of the Pacific Institute uh, on the West Coast, which uh, that for decades have been helping people through obstacles that they can't, they want to change, but they can't do it. So organizations like that teach us to want to change our experience, not wait for our experience to evolve. And my wife and I have learned in, in eight years of informal conversations in this way, that, uh, that attitudes are developed, they're not born. And there's five things that we, that can, they're cliches, but they continually come back and mean something. And that's to be purposeful, to be selfless, to be self-determined, empowered, and courageous. Sure, cliches, but that's what you lose when you get a diagnosis like this, and we've got to fight to get it back. The, the next point uh, has to do with the, re the resources we have at our disposal. There are many more than you think, and those two organizations, the MDA and the ALSA, and their Georgia chapters are just outstanding. They've been so good for my family and the friends that I've come to know, uh, so I don't think anybody needs a prompt from me to, uh, to go and look at what options there are in those sites. But there are many. They do so much service, so much research, both, that it's a, it's a fine thing. Uh, ALS Untangled is a great, it's a great um, way to distinguish real medicine from fake science. Uh, and um, there's people who contribute to that from all over the world, but it tries to tell you that this supplement or that drug being tested in, in Morocco or something is or is not um, uh, as advertised. And they don't have any crystal ball, but it's a, it's a great source to help cut through some of that blather. Uh, the next um, example is, and this is controversial, and that's the inherent unfairness of a double-blinded clinical trial. You won't find an ALS patient who just recoils at the idea of going through what it takes to be in a trial and perhaps be that placebo guy. Um, and, and until I went to, along with many, some in this room, ALS patients, and when we went to the conference last year in DC, about clinical trial ALS preparation, did I really learn that from a science standpoint, that will never align with a patient, a patient wish. 
with a, a fatal disease. I was an, ex an example, I, my ceftriaxone trial um, five years ago, six years ago, um, I had a Hickman catheter in my chest for a year and I carried around frozen study drug for everywhere I went, movies, restaurants, I had to have that study drug. And I ended up being the clinical trial, but I ended up being the placebo guy. But until I understood at that conference, um, and, and when the trial failed, I understood why it has to be that way. Because if it's not double-blinded, what, what do we learn? Uh, so one of the roles I try to take in my, lay, in my layman's ability is to try to tamp down some of that anger that comes from people who are told you don't qualify or you can't get in, or if you do, you may have to be a, a part of a 50% blind. So, uh, you know, people do get uh, angry at, uh, at God, at science, at policymakers, and they always will because we have so much skin in the game, but that's important. Then next, uh, the ALSA, uh, ALS plateaus and reversals. Uh, this is a wonderful site that uh, Dr. Rick Bedlack at Duke and others uh, continually uh, study and investigate within their means, um, things that are outside the box, because we all know there are no solutions that are gonna cure anybody inside the box. So uh, that team of people uh, publishes information about what they think is going on out there. They do their own trials on, on uh, food supplements and things that maybe wouldn't attract big pharma and that sort of thing. So um, th that's, a, that's a very big deal. So, um, I'm, I started a clinical. I started a study drug just um, a, a few months ago that I, that I wouldn't have known on known of at all without going to do that. So I'm going to end on a subject also very close to uh, ALS hearts, uh, and it has to do with uh, legislation and FDA approved um, uh, uh, programs, uh, right to try. Uh, uh, extended access programs, both of which getting a good run these days. Uh, right to try, as you know, and many of you know, has, has become law in 33 state legislatures. And with Scott Gottlieb taking over at the FDA, it may well have some legs. It'll get a good look, we know. And while I, I'm talking about, our, uh, about RTT laws, I have to honor a dear friend uh, who passed away last year of cancer. He was an ALS trial patient with me at Emory. That's Ted Harada of Atlanta. He has many friends in the community and way many friends nationally because he's been a tireless advocate haunting the halls of, of, uh, of state capitals and national capitals to make the case for a better understanding and better access for patients. Uh, through his own personal point of view and his force of character. So, Ted, we miss you, but thank you. Uh, the extended access, thank you, yes. <laughs> extended access programs are a little less con uh, controversial. Uh, they've been around for decades. In the 60s, experimental cancer drugs and HIV AIDS drugs reached thousands of people under the extended access program uh, and compassionate use premise. So uh, that's a fine thing. Uh, it's, ALS patients don't have access today, and there's a, a real stumbling point between doctors, patients, big pharma, study trial people, because they don't want their results compromised, or they don't want uh, you know lone wolf people out there claiming one thing or another. So I, my, what I, the way I think of EAP, is that it's about uh, the patient is dying. The patient can't get in a clinical trial, and the primary goal of these programs is, is for the patient treatment, not research. So I think if we keep the context of the discussion within those objectives, I think we'd have more converts. And there should be a way uh, forward for that in all of our communities. Um, so. Thank you for the long listen. It's a tough subject. 
Um, but uh, maybe we can fling open a door or two in the next couple of years of research. I know a lot of smart people are working on it. Uh, and we'll change this disease from a fatal disease to maybe a chronic condition. That's not sexy, but I don't use the word cure. I'm happy just to stall this thing and get all of us to another chapter in our life. Thank you very much. We can take some questions from the audience. Yes, ma'am. Testing. Can anybody hear? Yes. You guys can hear. So I'd just like to thank the panelists for an excellent, outstanding presentation. I actually have two questions, if you would allow me. So the first question is for um, ALS patients. What's the most common type of palliative care, and does that include any kind of physical therapy that really makes a difference? And uh, that's for Dr. Kasarkis or Dr. Tesario, or Mr. Tesario. And then I the defer second to question, Ed. Uh, oh, oh, Ed. And then the second question is for Dr. Horton. You may have said this, and I may have missed it. Um, but for the registrants in the registry, is there um, a post-mortem facet associated with it in terms of data collection that the registrants have to agree to? Hmm. If you understand that question. So I'll answer the uh, uh, question about physical therapy and massage therapy and occupational <laughs> therapy. These are the. The, the real nuts and bolts of what our multidisciplinary clinics do. Uh, you may have personal experience with that, but in, in one clinic visit, which for the patient lasts two to three hours, they see PT and OT, uh, those instructions are, are, you know, educated and transferred to the patient, family. Uh, I mean, first off, you know, uh, uh, ALS you cannot do by yourself. I mean, it's it's a family disease, a family condition. Uh, so many people are involved that have to take over more and more of the function. I mean, you saw the gentleman that I illustrated how, how weak he is. I, I mean, he's not going to comb his hair, not going to brush his teeth, not going to wipe his bottom, not going to rub his nose. So all of those functions have to be uh, taken over by family members. And there are a lot of physical therapy things that they have to learn. I, I always tell patients that if my wife had ALS, I would have to learn how to do this too. You know, you can read it in a book, but until you have hands-on experience of how to perform these functions, you, you really don't know. I mean, I'm, I presume I'm preaching to the converted here, but, but, uh, but I, I think it bears repeating. So, so a lot of those insights from our, our colleagues in the different disciplines are uh, transferred to the patients, and these things are, the, the clinics, I think, anticipate problems before they actually come, uh, and, and I think that that is much appreciated by our, our, our patients and families. So, Sharonda, I'm not exactly clear on what you're asking, but um, one of the things that we wanted to do is to make this registry as useful as possible, not only for patients, but for researchers as well. So one of the things that we do, constantly do, is when we go out to conferences and we meet with patients, meet with researchers, is to ask them, how can we improve this registry? And one of the things that was brought up is, you know, the, the collection of uh, samples from living people and the collection of samples from people who pass away and they're generous enough to donate their body to, to CDC to, to, to harvest the um, uh, biospecimens. And so I think that we have done a good job, or at least we're uh, on the way to uh, collecting, you know, samples that can be used for uh, research purposes. I mean, we probably won't use them here at CDC, but we didn't necessarily collect the samples for us here at CDC, but uh, for external scientists. And so the more we can shed light on this disease, whether it's through epidata or biospecimens or a combo of, the bo of both, 
then that's that's what we're trying to do. Um, one question from Paula very quickly. Yes, we have a question from our Facebook audience. They want to know why not push to make um, it a notifiable disease. So that's a very good question. Um, the issue there, we actually get that question quite a bit. One of the, the things there is when it, when it becomes notifiable, let's say for an STI or HIV, which is reported back to us eventually, there are states, and states are currently, when it comes to resources, reporting on, let's say, the STIs, HIVs from right now. But the premise is, because of lack of resources, if we say, let's go ahead and make ALS notifiable, then Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and other conditions may also, you know, have their group saying, let's also make it notifiable as well. So the resources, I don't believe, are there currently to go ahead and make it notifiable at the state level, to go ahead and report it to the national level. So that currently is just not feasible at this time. Yes, ma'am. So, so first, I'd like to thank Ed for reminding us that everyone has their own wheelchair. Um, but I have a question about the, um, the registry. Congratulations for uh, establishing it. It sounds really exciting and, and um, a way, something that could serve as a model. I'm very curious about, you have two methods for getting patients. One is through the databases and others is through just people signing up. And what's the relative proportion of people that you get from the different methods? And what percent of all ALS patients in the country do you think are in the red re registry? Um, how much overlap do you see between the people that you get from the databases and the ones who uh, sign up? And then lastly, and maybe you can't deal with all, all of these, um, you said you contact people who are in the registry, but some of those people you've only gotten from databases, not from them signing up. And so can you contact those people? No, we can't contact individuals from the national admin databases like Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, we can contact them with their consent from the actual online portal itself. The, uh, one of your questions was the proportion of the uh, databases compared to the online portal. It's about 85, 15. So a lot of the cases are coming from Medicare, Medicaid, uh, and the VA system itself. And we, there's an overlap as well. So we'll also see folks, uh, patients also in the databases as well as in the online portal as well. So, But I'd just like to follow up. Um, one of the things that we are trying to do is to ter determine how complete are the data, as you mentioned. And the data is only good as what you have in there. So we're doing a couple of things. One is we're using uh, statistical techniques, capture, recapture. I'm not going to go into that, but it's a way for us to gauge how complete the data are. And then we've also done active case finding um, efforts in three states and eight metropolitan areas using an active approach versus our more or less our passive approach. And so we're actually comparing the cases found in the act, active approach with those found in the in the uh, in the registry to see are we finding more cases out there that you know we should be capturing. So it's an ongoing challenge not only for this registry but for any registry or any data collection that you're doing. You want to know how complete the data are, and yeah. so these are some of the things that we're doing to try to figure yeah. that out. And just to quickly mention, with any surveillance system like which this one is, it's impossible to capture all the cases. So, um, Dr. Red, you had a question as well. Um, yeah, thanks. Really, uh, very, very nice session, and I, it really reminds me of Grand Rounds from uh, from medical training. Um, a question um, about that that curve that shows the progression. It made me wonder whether um, there's thinking about an incident event, or when a, when a, when a person actually goes from not having the disease to having it, and how far back people think that is in terms of the um, the loss of, uh, of neurons. Yes, that's an excellent question. Did um, you all hear the question? Yeah, okay. I think he was on the microphone. Right. So, so the, there is one way of trying to gauge the, the speed of progression. I didn't make the comment, but every patient is individual, so we have some individuals, of course, that progress rapidly and some that have progressed slowly. That's obviously a, a group average. Um, and, and there's one technique of saying what your ALS functional rating scale is. The first time you encounter the medical system, and, and back it up to as best you can tell from historical data when someone first develops weakness. But we know, uh, based on the EMG in, uh, information, that the, the process biologically in the spinal cord goes on, has gone on for a long period of time. Because when you think about it, 
I, I, I didn't get into this, but you know, all the motor neurons don't die off at the same time. So you'll have one die off and the other remaining ones will, will sort of sprout and take over the territory. So as far as the patient is concerned, I'm still strong. And in fact, you know, Lou Gehrig was mentioned. Uh, he was diagnosed in 39. That's not when his disease began. It began in 1938. He played the entire year, you know, and, and his batting average was, quote, only 295. You know, the previous, <laughs> the previous year it was like 345. So, so he had a drop off in function, but he, he continued to play. Uh, and he played every single game. Uh, so, so, you know, the, it's a little bit of an artifact of when you're diagnosed. And, and, and that's part of, I think, the benefit of the registry is the awareness factor uh, is out there. So a lot of times patients will come to the clinic with, with their Google online search of, of papers. And, and they might be the ones who have suggested to the primary care doctor, I think I have ALS. You know, I mean, we, we have some, some backfires on that, that strategy, but, but still the point is that I think the awareness factor is getting patients in a little bit earlier. The, the, the truth of the matter is that in Europe and North America, it's roughly nine to 12 months before you go through this diagnostic process, before you have a confirmatory second opinion about ALS. Still takes a long period of time. And, and you know, biologically, those are motor neurons in the spinal cord and brain that are dying. And, and so a drug, a purported drug treatment is, is fighting for the remaining 30 or 40 percent of the natural endowment of motor neurons. So it's a challenge. I, I realize you can wipe out those comments and say put in Alzheimer's and put in Parkinson's. I, I think the same premise is there. Uh, it's an uphill battle with these neurodegenerative conditions. Thank you all very much. Uh, we're going to have to uh, end, end our, our webcast and our, our session now. Um, thanks very much to all of our presenters. Um, for those who submitted questions online, you will receive, uh, you will receive uh, answers. Uh, and uh, please join us next month when we are going to uh, rebroadcast uh, last month's uh, session where we had some uh, technical problems. Thank you very much.